Well, good morning again, everyone. My name is Lacey Villava. I'm the Education Manager at Gunston Hall, and I'm joined today by one of our guest services staff members, Holly Irwin, and we'll be facilitating our three activities you see on the screen today. We're also joined by Laura Hollywood, who may be popping in and off, uh, giving her us some thoughts um, while she's in with us this morning. Um, and we will be exploring these three games that you see on the screen. Um, we'll be starting with Shut the Box, which is a really fun game played by people um, who were not the Masons. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about who that was. We're going to explore an 18th century game mystery left to us in some documentary evidence. And we're also going to look at a game that originated in Africa um, and was probably played by people who were enslaved here at Gunston Hall called Mancala. So we'll start with Shut the Box, um, and we'll talk, we'll spend a, a couple of moments uh, just to start with talking about games in the 18th century. So we're looking at a game party. This is a detail of a much larger uh, uh, portrait of a whole group of people having a tea party in Great Britain in the 1730s. Um, but we zoomed in on this detail of this very fancy group of people playing cards. Cards were the game, uh, any kind of card game was the game um, in the 18th century. That was absolutely something that happened at all different social levels. Uh, we're seeing obviously here a really fancy group of people playing cards and based on their setup, I believe they're probably playing a game called Whist. Whist was the game in the 18th century. Um, there are in fact a number of game manuals uh, produced in the 18th century, which include all sorts of games um, and then say things like, we won't include the rules to whist because everybody knows how to play it. So if you didn't know how to play whist, you weren't worth playing with. But there were card games played by other groups of people. Uh, this is a detail of an engraving uh, called playing at put. Put was a gambling game. Almost all card games in the 18th century were based around gambling, but this one was particularly seen as being low class, um, played by people who were not particularly affluent. Um, and uh, we can see here a group of gentlemen um, playing at this game, and I can tell looking at them uh, with my eye that these are people who are working class. And I can see that in part if we flip back up to our last slide, these gentlemen in the portrait here, they have very deep, deep cuffs, um, very elegant trimmings on their clothing. They've got wigs on, whereas the gentlemen in, the, in this portrait are wearing their own hair. They're not wearing wigs. This gentleman has his cut long, uh, but you can see this gentleman here has his cut short. They're also not wearing really fancy clothing. This cuff is really plain. And in fact, this guy kind of looks like he's just playing in a vest, a waistcoat, and his shirt. And that was not done by high society in the 18th century. But there were also board games. This board game might look very similar to one that you have at home although it's a heck of a lot fancier than any board game I have in my house. Uh, this chessboard, um, which could possibly also have been used to play checkers, um, is made out of ebony, ivory, and silver. And this would have been something that perhaps graced the Mason's table. We know that other people were playing checkers and chess, uh, but their boards were much less fancy and haven't survived through today but there are other games as well. This game over here in the corner appears very frequently in 18th century um, portraiture and drawings. Uh, this is an Italian image, but we see this game showing up across all Western European cultures. Um, it's often called trip track. Um, today we would call this backgammon. If you look really carefully, you can just see the triangles um, that are used in stacking up the pieces, which are all stacked up here in a tower. Um, and this was played across social levels from the lowest um, levels of society all the way through families like the Masons. 
Finally here, we've got this Dutch portrait of these really lower class gentlemen uh, playing a board game as well. This guy, in fact, isn't even sitting on a chair. He's sitting on an overturned bucket. Uh, but clearly they're playing with a board game here on this little kind of rickety looking table. So we're going to spend some time this morning looking at an 18th century game that was played probably by people of the social level that we see in this image and the one um, that we saw the three gentlemen playing at put. Um, it was most likely played largely in taverns probably more by men than women in the 18th century because women were typically not invited into taverns. Um, although I'm always on the hunt for more evidence of games being played by people that we don't quite expect. Um, so we're gonna take a look at a really cool, really simple board game that you can make at home that derives from the 18th century original. So if you want to play along, here are the supplies that you want. And while you get set up with those supplies, I'm gonna kill my camera and my microphone on this screen and I'm gonna move over to our overhead camera so that I can show you how to make your own shut the box. So um, over here on our overhead camera, this is the finished version of what we're going to make today. And right now I am looking at a finished version of it um, what all that's missing on this board game right now are a pair of dice, which I am stealing from another game that we have here at Gunston Hall. Um, you can totally borrow dice from another game, make this with a piece of cardstock, and have a really simple, really fun game. Now, if you have questions while we're making this board game today, feel free to shout them out or type them in the chat. And Holly, if you can read them out for me since I can't see the screen on our top-down camera today. All right, let's get started. So I'm starting with a blank piece of cardstock. You can use whatever paper you have at home. Cardstock I find works the best. It stands up the test of bending um, the little markers on the regular. Um, but you can use copy paper, really, truly, whatever you have at home. So we're first going to start by making a space for our tabs to go. So I'm going to measure out about an inch and a half down the side. I'm using a marker to mark mine today so that you guys can see it on screen. At home, use whatever you've got. It doesn't matter. So I'm just using that marker to give myself a guideline for those tabs. And I'm gonna fold along this line right here. All right. So this now becomes a guideline for me to cut each of the individual tabs too. And these you can go totally free form if you want to. If you want to be truly exact, we're making 10 tabs and that means a snip every 1.2 inches, which is a little hard on a standard ruler. So I'm kind of eyeballing it. My tabs aren't gonna be perfectly even, but that's okay. Um, the game will still work just as it is intended. Um, regardless of whether or not your tabs are even. The very first set I made, the tabs were wildly different. But you know what? The game still worked and that was the important part. All right, so I've just got a couple more tabs. Holly, do we have any thoughts or questions in the chat? Nope, not right now. Okay. All right, so I'm using those little tick marks I made as guidelines just to give myself a line to cut along. I like for my lines to be fairly straight. I don't know about you, but I'm really bad at cutting straight lines freehand. How about you, Holly? I know you're not a particularly crafty person. I am not, so therefore I cannot cut straight lines. <laughs> How about you, Laura? Are your lines straight and beautiful every time? I know you are a crafty person. 
I was gonna say, I think I, I can actually probably say, yeah, I'm fairly <gasps> good at it, uh, thanks to working at a fabric cutting store. So I have learned to cut a very straight line, not only for short distances, but also quite long distances. It's one nice. of my hidden talents now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So I'm gonna mark the insides of my tabs with the numbers before I cut. Um, it just, I don't know why. You can do it in any order. It doesn't matter if you cut um, before or after you mark your tabs. Um, and you probably can't see it on screen, but I can just faintly see the markings for my tabs. So I'm gonna do the back as well. Again, if you're more comfortable cutting your tabs first, and then marking them, totally fine too. Do whatever makes you happy. All right, so my board is almost done. I just need to snip all of my tabs along the lines. And I'm cutting just to that original cut mark. I don't wanna cut any further. I mean, it won't, it won't hurt if you overshoot the line by, you know, a little bit but you want them to be fairly even so that they bend pretty straight. Yep, cut that one over just a little bit. Um, so this is, not, this is not an exact science. It's fine if they're a little bit off, um, it'll still work, but you want them to bend fairly evenly. All right, so there's my board. And here comes the fun part. Um, I was not a math student in school. I got into grad school and they said, well, you're not going to grad school for math, so we won't pay too much attention to your GRE math score. Yes. Uh, but this is a game I really like and I find really fun and I love to play with kids. It's really good at helping to think about um, how different things add up. So I'm going to roll my dice and I've rolled a six. Now all of my tabs on this board are currently flipped up, which means any of them are eligible to be flipped down. I could just flip down my six, or I can flip down five and one, two and four, or one, two and three. Any combination of those numbers. Now I'm, I have a strategy that I think works pretty well for me. So today I'm going to flip down my six. So that six is flipped down and I roll my dice again. Ooh, I flipped a two. Definitely taking that one because that's the only one I can take for that roll. And I rolled again and I think that rolled off camera. I rolled another six. So now I'm getting into the danger zone because I've only got one option left for my six. I've got a five and a one. And I rolled a seven. Okay, cool, that works. I'm gonna put down the seven. And I rolled an eight, still safe. Rolled, put down my eight. Rolled a 10, this is a great one. Tens are often really hard to get. So I get to put down my 10 and I still have a nine, a three and a four up. So I could hit it really lucky, I could hit it really poorly and be stuck with these three tabs still up. I rolled a 10. So I'm done. I can't add any of these numbers up to get a 10. That's a nine. <gasps> a nine, I can't math! Thanks, Holly. <laughs> now I really am in the danger zone because I've only got seven. Oh, and a four. All right, so I get one more roll to see if I put my three down or not and I'm not lucky today. So I still have three points against me. And if I were playing with somebody else, it would now be their turn. Or if you want to make two boards and play two people at the same time, you can do that too. Um, but in any case, those three points go against me. My partner would be doing their roles as well, trying to get as few points on the board as possible. The absolute best score is where the game gets its name. That's called shutting the box, and that's when every tab is down. That person automatically wins. And if you're playing this 18th century style and you're betting, everybody puts an equal amount of money into the pot at the start. And when you get done, whoever has the lowest score or whoever shuts the box 
wins the game. Anybody have any thoughts or questions about this one right now? Well, no worries. If you do, feel free to type them in the chat or we'll let you know when it is another appropriate time to shout them out loud. But we're gonna head off to our next activity and I've got a switch back camera so I can get our screen share going for Holly again. Eric and Nicole, I see your comment that it looks like a lot of fun. That, like I said, this is absolutely one of my favorite games that we play here at Gunston Hall. I have a question, Lacey. Yeah, of course. Who played that game that you just uh, showed us? Great question. So this is probably probably men, and maybe it's tenant farmers like Thomas Halbert, who we talked about last week, or sorry, two weeks ago, in our food theme summer Saturday. Um, maybe it is William Buckland, who was an indentured servant and then a freedman um, here in Virginia during George Mason's lifetime. He actually helped build Gunston Hall. He designed the interiors and probably managed the work of people who were enslaved. We're not entirely certain. So those are the kinds of people who were typically playing um, Shut the Box. This is typically not a game that George Mason or his family members probably were playing. Uh, just because of where we know that it was played historically. But great question. Thanks, Holly. And Holly is going to take us into our next activity, which is a little bit of a mystery. Yes, it is. And you won't need any materials for this except your noggin. So put on your thinking caps or your detective caps, whatever you want to call your cap. And we're going to get started with the mystery game. And first, I want to introduce this lovely fella. His name was Philip Vickers Finthian. He was a tutor for the Carter family who lived in the northern neck of Virginia. Um, so he definitely would have been around the Carter children the majority of the day. He's teaching them. Um, he's also experiencing a lot of the things, other things that are happening on the plantation as well. And he's very important because his diaries, his letters have survived and it kind of gives us a idea of what 18th century life was like on a plantation. Um, so we believe the Carter family was in a similar situation as the Masons. So this is why it's important um, for us um, because, you know, he's probably in a similar situation as the um, the Masons in terms of what life was like on the plantation. But also this photo is just lovely. I mean, it looks like he has some, something going on with his upper lip. That's the first thing I noticed when I saw this. But Yeah, he's got a weird shadow there. The, the shading is kind of fascinating. Um, <laughs> but he's, I mean, he's wearing what's in fashion, these deep colored, um, jackets were in fashion in the 1770s which is you know spot on yes definitely okay so the reason that i bring him up is because he wrote some a diary entry as well as a letter indicating this mystery game so if Lacey, you want to go to the next slide for me so basically feel free to read if you really want to but also you can just I can give you the information that might be easier. Um, so in this diary entry, he is writing about these girls imitating chores that would have been done probably around the house or just in the kitchen yard or anywhere in that area. Um, and so he is talking about those girls. And the thing that I want you guys to pay attention to is what's highlighted. And it says, and often at a small game with peach stones, which they call checks, peach stones or peach pits is what is commonly used today. And so the thing that struck me was first, he is not being specific as to um, who these girls are. Are they the Carter girls? Are they enslaved girls? We just don't know at this very point. Um, so that's also kind of a mystery in terms of um, the game itself and then who is actually playing the game. But then, Lacey, if you want to go on the next slide. 
we found this, which is just a second piece of the puzzle. Um, and this is a letter that he is writing to one of the Carter girls. And he is saying, tell me who is yet mistress at checks. I believe if you will allow me to guess at so great a distance, it is Fanny. And Fanny is one of the Carter girls. So we can assume that he is talking about the Carter girls playing this game, which they call checks and possibly not an enslaved um, group of girls. Uh, but again, something that is so frustrating and exciting about history is that there are so many mysteries and there are so many questions that go unanswered and it drives me bonkers because you just want to know everything. But in this instance, it's one of those things where we can't definitively say whether or not it was the Carter girls, um, but we're going to assume that at this point. But then the other mystery is what is checks? He doesn't go into specifically the uh, rules of it or how the girls are playing it. All he says was that they were using peach stones and then they called it checks. So Holly, I'm looking at this quote and I just had a thought because these two instances are what, six months apart? I believe so. Yeah. So he mentions it in that diary entry at one point and now in this letter he's gone um back to new jersey where he's originally from and he's like all right who's who's winning so clearly this is a game that they play frequently yes and the fact that the girls were playing it and and they were in the letter he's saying that they are replicating what they the girls see in the kitchen yard in the house so we can assume that like the adults were possibly playing this game, like maybe the Carter sisters' parents. We don't know, but it's definitely right. a good guess. Yeah, it's fascinating. So I did a little digging and I tried to figure out, you know, connect some dots, like what is checks? What games in the 18th century were using peach stones or peach pits? Um, and I came up with two different theories again these are just this is my interpretation of it so if you guys feel so compelled you can go off and um, do your own research but I want to give you guys some insight of what I um, specifically came up with so theory one is the Native American peach stone game now this could be a little bit of a stretch but um, this peach stone game was uh, played by the, uh, excuse me one second, I'm forgetting the name of the tribe. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The, oh my goodness. Anyways, sorry, I can't, my uh, notes are a little spacey. But basically, this game was played by Native Americans that would have been located in this part of Virginia um, way back then. So maybe it was a game that was just passed through the generations and somehow the um, Carter girls picked up this game or maybe their parents did, it's just unsure. And as you can see in this picture is that they're not peach stones, they're beans. So possibly this game was used with multiple different types of materials because of the simplicity of it basically how it works is that you take a peach stone um, or maybe some beans or another type of material you paint one side either black or white and leave the other side as is and what you do is that you put all these stones or beans into a basket and then you're playing with another person usually and you're trying to flip over the most um, beans or peach pits as possible and so the person who flips them ends up winning. And if it falls out of the basket, you don't get that point. So it's very simple. It was also, um, from my research, a gambling game for the Native Americans. So, you know, it was very interesting. So this is, you know, possible that they could have been playing this. I went down a rabbit hole one day and just kept <laughs> researching this one game. And so 
I was very happy that the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History had a picture of the materials. I think that's pretty cool. Um, but you come up with your own conclusion if you think that I'm going a little bit cuckoo, but. <laughs> and I, I love in this image that we can also see that some of them are painted. Yeah. Just the surfaces of the natural beans on some sides, but you can, you can see that some of them are in fact painted. That's really cool. Yes. I think it is too. And you have a second theory, right, Holly? I do. I do have a second theory. This one is a little bit more plausible and probably most likely what the Carter girls were playing, but it's chess, checkers, or drafts. And checks was a way to refer to these games. It just kind of like shortened checkers a little bit to create checks. And so this was a game, these were games that were commonly played uh, by a lot of people in the 18th century. Um, it originated in England and obviously came over to the new colonies when uh, British came over here. No, British, excuse me. The British, um, you know, made their way to the colonies. Um, and so we, I just think that this was most likely what the Carter girls were playing. Um, it was also a game usually played by that class. Um, so it makes the most sense, um, but it's really, we can't, you know, again, can't say for certain whether or not this was it because it's just not indicated. So that's why it's the mystery game or that's why we're calling it the mystery game. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, Lacey, I put up the, um, the quotes from what uh, Philip is saying again. And if you guys want to come up with your own theories or you have your own thoughts and opinions on this, please do either type it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Um, but we wanna know what you think. I, mean, I just like, had, I just had another thought. <laughs> could they, could they have been used like jacks and jacks and checks? Possibly, um, yeah. Very similar and peach, I could see using peach pits mm -hmm. as jacks. Yeah, definitely would have been a material yeah. that could readily get. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. See, like we're talking about this now and like more things just keep popping up. So it's really, that's why it's called a mystery game because yeah. I love mysteries in history. They give us lots of opportunity to use our critical thinking skills and try to, to hunt things down. I mean, I know you, Holly, spent a really long time um, looking at these. Um, and, and I spent time, you know, on the Oxford English Dictionary hunting up the words. Yeah. Ooh, we have an in the chat. Um, could they be arranged on the ground and jumped like fox and geese? Have you ever played fox and geese, Holly? I'm not sure. I believe I have. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, it, it's a it's a great idea, Eric and Nicole. Um, fox and geese, for those who don't know, is a game often played on a board with pegs. There is one dark colored peg. Um, and the rest are all light colored. The dark color is a fox and the light color is a goose. Um, and the geese work together to try to entrap the fox. Um, the fox and the geese hop over one another. And if you are, if the um, fox hops the geese, the geese are out of the game. Basically the fox has eaten the goose. Okay. Um, yeah, so this, I wouldn't, this could be um, used a lot like that. I love that idea. That's a great one. That's a really good point. Yeah. Well, I think those are some, I, I, we've come up with some new ideas today and I love that. And, and that's all what history is about for us here at Gunston Hall. We are always looking and digging for more information, for more answers. And we'd love for you as our participants to be a part of, of deciding what things, you know, we, we can provide you with the information and you help us make a decision. Um, I think that's always the most fun for me. Any other thoughts on our mystery game, Holly? No, other than to 
do your own research. Um, if you guys come across like another his, history mystery, oh gosh, that rhymes. <laughs> um, feel free to just share it with us. We're always interested to see what people come up with. So absolutely, and I dropped the um, email address um, historic at gunstonhall.org in the chat. Feel free to send us your ideas, your thoughts, your questions at the historic account or um, drop them to us on social media. We pay attention to all of our social media channels. Yes. Ooh, we had another one. Um, they may be using the peach pits like Penny Toss. Um, yeah, which has another name that I, is escaping my brain right now. Um, but there are a couple of games where you're trying to toss um, pennies or other markers. Um, into a circle or at a specific spot on a wall, um, trying to get them as close to whatever indicator. There are several games um, like that. Um, in fact, if you look at this really awesome um, book from the 18th century, which you can find on Google Books and in other places online, called The Pretty Little Pocket Book, there are lots of games, um, many of which have um, modern descendants, some of which have fallen by the wayside in history, but definitely check those out and, um, and take a look. You might find some, some inspiration there as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. So we're going to head into our um, last activity for the day, which is a little less of a mystery. Um, it's looking at a game that has been in the world for centuries. Um, but we're learning more about every time um, people start doing research into it. So we're looking now at a game called Mancala. And um, I don't know about you all, but when I was a kid, I learned how to play Mancala. But it was a game that didn't have any connotations really for me. Um, I kind of vaguely knew that it was descended from Africa, but I didn't really know a whole lot more about it. Um, and then I started encountering it a lot at historic sites, uh, particularly at sites where slavery was involved. Um, and so I started doing some research about where it came from, what it was, and I came across some really interesting things. So this first image that we're looking at is two young women um, in Turkey in the 18th century playing the game called Mancala. And that is the Mancala board right there between them. Um, and this appears to have uh, been really popular, particularly in places that we would today identify as the Middle East and in Upper Africa. In fact, in the very late 17th century in the 1690s, a gentleman named Thomas Hyde, who was British, published a book called uh, De Ludus Oriental Orientalibus Libri Duo, which basically translates to Games of the Orient. And one of the games that's included there is De Ludo Mancala, which is, of course, the game that we refer to today as Mancala. Um, he was a really interesting person. He did lots of books about um, what they called in the 18th century the Orient, which included the Middle East, parts of India, Asia, China, um, um, all through um, most of, of Southeast Asia. Um, but in this case, uh, this is coming from uh, the, the Arabic portion of the world, and you can see uh, the Arabic script with its um, Western European translations in there. And this is basically explaining how the game Mancala is played. Well, Mancala originated, we think, somewhere around Egypt, so northwestern Africa, sorry, northeastern Africa, and then was disseminated across into Turkey, into the Balkans. There's a 14th century archeological remnant of a Mancala board in a Balkan um, castle that was found in about 2006. Um, there's evidence of it then spreading into Africa. And Mancala actually is a family name for a large group of games. 
And in Western Africa, and most of the people who would have been coming from Africa to the Caribbean and or to places like Virginia, they're playing a version of the game called Aware. That's spelled O-W-A-R-E. I'm typing that into the chat. Um, whoops. Um, I'm typing that into the chat so everybody can see that spelling. Um, but it's got lots of different names and individual places play different versions of the game. So you might know a different version than what we're going to play today. I was really excited though uh, when I found this image. This is a German book published in 1807 um, and it shows a man collar board with all of the pits um, or the pots for uh, material to be distributed in. And we talk a little bit more about the game in just a minute. There are also capture areas on either end of the board um, that this one is using. And this is from um, a place that the original print note um, calls Senegambia, which is an area that no longer exists as it, as it did in the 18th and early 19th century, but is in Western Africa. And then I came across this second one, which we have another young woman uh, playing another Mancala type game um, from a book called The World in Miniature, which is all about Africa. Um, and Mr. Frederick Schrobel was um, of Germanic descent, but living in Great Britain at the time. Um, so his book is published in English. And here in the description of the book, it says a Negro girl studying the game of Awari. So we know this game is in West Africa. We know that people are playing this game, but the boards vary. Sometimes we have really amazing boards like we see in these three images, but sometimes this game is played by just scratching out little pits in the ground. And maybe it's using peach stones like the ones Holly described for a game mystery. And maybe it uses actual stones. Maybe it uses clay marbles. There are lots of different options for all of the game pieces. So historically here in Virginia, it's likely not to leave a whole lot of archaeological evidence for us to find. But based on the evidence that is given to us of descriptions of people in Africa playing this game, people in the Caribbean playing this game, it's highly likely that people who were enslaved here at Gunston Hall during George Mason's lifetime were playing a game of the Mancala family. So we're going to take a look at how you can make a Mancala board to play at home. Here are the instructions, or sorry, the supplies that you'll need to get started. And I'm going to transition back over to the overhead cam so you can see what we're doing. If you give me just a second, I will pop back on screen there. All right, here we are back over at the overhead camera. Again, Holly, if you can shout out questions, do feel free to type them into the chat or unmute yourself and share them aloud. But if you wish to type them in the chat, Holly, if you could read those out loud for me, that would be awesome. Sure. Fantastic. Okay. So again, we're using some really simple materials that you can find at home. Um, you probably have egg cartons at home. Um, if you don't, there's probably somebody that you can uh, grab one from. I know I have lots. So we're going to take this egg carton and deconstruct it because guess what? It's got built-in pits that we can use for our Mancala board. So I'm just going to cut the top off. And I'm going to cut the clasp off. And that's it. My Mancala board is ready. Now, because we are playing virtually and so that Holly and I can be socially distanced and not be wearing our masks so it's a little easier to understand what we're saying. I have added some helpful tools. So this is my side of the board and this is Holly's side of the board and you may remember in that one really fancy 
uh, board that we saw, it had the capture areas on either side of the board. So there's mine. And there's Holly's. So now it's ready for us to play virtually. And this is a way that you could make this game happen. If you've got family members, say, on the other side of the country that you're having a Zoom chat with, or if you really need to be in quarantine. Now, I've got some ancient dried lima beans here from our stash at Gunston Hall. Uh, we keep lots of interesting things because you never know when they're going to come in handy. And to set the board up for play, I'm going to put four beans in each pit. Nope, I can count, I promise. Although you guys may not believe me after now not being able to do it twice in a row. Okay, so um, there is some strategy to playing Mancala. We're not going to go too deep in that today. If you're interested in learning about more, there are plenty of sites about there, out there about modern Mancala play. The basic gist of the game, though, is that you pick up all of the seeds, pits, stones, whatever you're using to play. Uh, heck, you could even use paper clips. You pick up all of them in one pit, and you start transferring them down. When you get to your capture area, you drop a seed in and you keep going if you've got enough to go. Once you've dropped all of your seeds out, your turn is done, unless your turn ends in your capture area, in which case you get to pick another well from your side and keep going. If you end up putting seeds down, for example, if Holly had picked up and her last seed went into this pit and this, this one was, sorry, nope, did that wrong. If it was my turn and I put my last one down into an empty well, I would get to collect all of the pits from over here. Now the game ultimately plays, we've got 48 beans in here. The game plays to 24 or until one side of the board is empty. We're not going to play that long today because it's not particularly fascinating for you to sit there the entire time it takes us to play the whole game. So we're just going to play to five today. Holly, do you want to go first this morning? Sure. Okay. I numbered them backwards from the way I did last time. Typically, gameplay goes from left to right. So Holly is technically, this should be number one for you today, but I numbered it backwards because numbers okay. and I are having a grand old time today. But tell me the number that's on here. Sure. Uh, let's do five. Five. All right. So five. You are also, etiquette says today, in modern Mancala games, and I wouldn't be surprised if this is the case in the 18th century as well, you're supposed to handle them only with one hand. So I picked all of them up, and I'm spreading them out, and we're going to land in pit number one, and Holly's turn is done. So now it's my turn, and I'm going to take these beans and go one, two, three. Did not time that well. That's okay. My turn's done, but I've got one in my pit. Holly, it's your turn. I'll do four. Four. All right. And I ended in my capture area, so I get to go again. And I am going to this one. Your turn, Holly. Three. Three. And isn't it true, Lacey, that, you know, I grew up playing it a very different way than what we're playing now? And isn't it true that there's, like, multiple there are so many variations absolutely and if this is not the version you have learned that's okay play your version play a different version learn a new one mm -hmm. whatever works for you all 
All right, your turn, Holly. Do six. Six. Because I keep putting beans in there. No, I don't have a strategy here. I'm just kind of eyeballing it. Well, you get another turn because you ended in your capture area. So which one would you like now? Two, two. Two. Right, my turn. I think I'm gonna win this round, Holly. So I got myself to five, so we're gonna stop there for today. But the gameplay, as I mentioned earlier, would continue until one or the other capture area has 24, or we're just gonna do this for visual sake one side of the board is empty. Those are the two ways to end this game. And the person who wins is the person who has the most beans, seeds, game pieces in their capture area. Real close game today. Holly's got four, I've got five. Good game, good game. Good game, thank you, Holly. I'm gonna switch over back over to my um, regular camera for just a couple of seconds and um, we've got one more quick thing we can look at. We have a great question in the chat. Um, people have been enjoying this program. Thank you for letting us know. We appreciate that you are enjoying it. We will be doing more programs in the fall and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a couple of minutes. Uh, before we wrap up, because we've got a couple more minutes, I do want to take a look at one more thing um, before we depart for the day, um, because I got a chance to do a little bit of research into some 18th century nursery rhymes. Um, and I want to take a look at um, a couple, one that you might recognize and one that might be a little different from what you remember. So I don't know about you, but Mary Mary Quite Contrary was absolutely a nursery rhyme that I listened to and talked about um, when I was a kid. Words are a tiny bit different, but mostly this one is pretty similar to what I remember. Mistress Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells, and so my garden grows. But how about this one? Curious, what is the word after lady? This one? No, on the set other page 53. Oh, the top paragraph? Yes. This right here is an 18th century etc. Okay. So this is basically, in this case, indicating that, um, that you've got a chorus. So um, when I was a kid, I did London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down, London Bridge is falling down, my fair lady. Take the key and lock her up, lock her up, lock her up, take the key and lock her up, my fair lady. And then we repeat London Bridge. So that, is, that et cetera, on the end is indicating that you come back over and pick up the chorus again. And then these are the verses. So clearly it's both nursery rhyme and song, although we don't have any music with this version. Um, when I did some research, it showed that the music changed and the music that we have today is actually what was set to the nursery rhyme in the 19th century and that there were some other music pieces set to it, including, 
think I've got it in here. Yes, the song, the tune for London Bells. Um, and I have a really hard time figuring out how the tune for London Bells would go to London Bridge. Not working out in my brain so well. Um, this nursery rhyme has continued to be fairly popular in Great Britain, but is no longer popular if it ever was in the United States. Um, so you, you can find this one and hear it, uh, but it's got, it's a great little rhyme. Um, two sticks and an apple, ring the bells at Whitechapel. Old father, bald pate, ring the bells at all gate. Um, and I continuously hear this in all of the British shows that I watch these days, but it's not something I ever hear in American music. Yeah, and I, I see in the, the chat um, that we've uh, printed the the as Y-E vertically. Also, I find if I scribble really fast, um, particularly if I'm practicing my 18th century style script, that my the, if I don't cross the T, often looks like a Y-E. So I, yeah, they're saving space in the page. Um, and this is a tiny book, by the way. Um, this book is only about this big. We have blown it up so it's easier to read on screen. Uh, but the book would have been perfect for a child size hand or in the 18th century to fit in mom's pocket. Mom's pockets were big in the 18th century. Take a look, Google 18th century women's pockets and you'll see the difference is, is pretty vast. Anyone have any other thoughts or questions before we close out our summer Saturdays for 2020? Well, I want to give a big thank you to all of our participants this summer. It's been an amazing and very different experience for us here at Gunston Hall, creating Summer Saturdays as a, a virtual program. Um, we are really excited. We are going to continue to be doing virtual programs through fall of 2020 at minimum. We'll probably be continuing to do um, occasional uh, virtual programs as we continue to do um, in-person programs again in 2021. So keep your eyes peeled on our website. If you haven't signed up for our mailing list, please feel free to do so. Our fall program themes include things about Constitution Day next month. The 17th of September is Constitution Day, and we'll be talking about Mason's thoughts about the Constitution. Um, we're going to be doing some food-themed programming in October. We're still working out exactly what that is going to look like, but we'll definitely be talking cocktails towards the end of October. So if you'd like to have a drink with us, um, hang out on our, um, our social media platform or on our website and learn about when we'll be doing that. Um, and we'll be talking about the Revolutionary War in November. So keep your eyes peeled on our social media, sign up for our mailing list, and we will be doing those in the future. Um, we're also looking at some special virtual member benefits starting the fall of 2020. So if you aren't already a member of Gunston Hall, I definitely encourage you to become one. Information about how to do that, how to sign up, is on our website at gunstonhall.org support. Thank you so much for participating with us again. We really enjoyed having you with us this summer from all kinds of places all over the world and right here in Virginia. We're so excited that you were able to join us. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.